Um, so I'm Benjamin. I'm a visiting researcher at Teachers College Columbia, and I'm a video game researcher from Austria who's currently working on a gamified workshop to strengthen moral competence. Um, so a bit to me and my background, so you won't be listening to a stranger for the next 25 minutes. I'm specializing in game-based learning, game design and ethics. So I'm inherently interested in how to use game design to create um, learning experiences um, effectively. Uh, I've been in video games research for four years, mostly on the academic side and started with RQ Gaming. And I'm now more focused on ethics, however, I've been always interested in this interface between education, learning, and video games. Currently working also as a researcher and educator in Austria and in Poland at two universities. And I've just recently co-founded a games collective, which is called Control Z, where I develop uh, games. And yeah, my mission is trying to make the world a little less exhausting with video games. A lot of people always say that they try to make the world better. I think I like to scope things, and what I really like to think about um, where more things could be done would be to make experiences in our professional lives, whether we're students or whether we are working in a company, less exhausting by using game design and video games, not to make these experiences simpler and easier, but to allow us to acquire skills that make us more competent in dealing with stressful situations. Um, and yeah, the mother of all skills to deal with stressful situation is ethics. Um, ethics, um, I could have a whole lecture on that, but to make it very brief, when we speak of ethics, I mean at least um, a system of principles that guide us or that lead the way or that lead our behavior uh, in a certain way. Um, principles such as help is good or um, or basically asking what is good and act upon that. However, I also believe that uh, ethics are not just theoretical as other scholars might indicate. I think ethics is inherently something practical. Therefore, I also be, uh, go very much in line with uh, what Aristotle says, but also Judith Butler in referring to ethics as something performative. So in order to have any, uh, to, to um, to deal effectively with ethics, we must consider ethics not just as systems of principles, but practical systems of principles that can be performed, that can be applied. And what would be the best medium to engage or simulate these experiences, um, if not video games? Um, this is a scene from Assassin's Creed Odyssey where there is an infected group of people of a virus, uh, with a virus on the island and the local priesthood decides to kill these people to save the rest of the island. So you as the protagonist in here have the choice to either intervene and free these people or just pull out, have no say in this for whatever reason. Um, these scenes are very common in contemporary video games. We know them from games such as Detroit Become Human, Assassin's Creed, Bioshock, um, Mass Effect, Papers, Please, Civilization, where there's scripted or emergent moral encounters are everywhere and used effectively as very innovative and progressive game design element. And I think that they offer a perfect chance to learn on how to design experiences that could have um, positive impact on our moral education. Uh, however, playing 80 hours of Assassin's Creed doesn't necessarily make you morally competent, and that is why I'll talk about my research and my research project while I'm here at Columbia and um, why and how I am approaching video games and moral education to provide sustainable and effective uh, um, game-based learning strategy. In order to do that, we'll talk briefly about the field that I'm dealing with, video game ethics, um, talk about some issues of it and talk about the concept of moral competence. I then go over to a workshop by Georg Lind, a psychologist that helps to strengthen moral competence, how I have then uh, adapted that workshop and gamified it and go over to prospects and conclusions and it, hopefully we have enough time for a discussion. So video game ethics um, isn't probably something most of you have heard of, but most of you have 
definitely heard of game studies. Video game ethics is a sub branch of uh, game studies and uses mainly three perspectives to, to um, in which research aligns or methodologies, which is on one side regarding morality as design element. So how is morality implemented? How is it operationalized? How is a moral economy created in the game? And how does feedback to the player is communicated um, either through mechanics or narrative? Another way to look at it is regarding players as moral agents. This is um, research that uses phenomenological approaches, but also um, a lot of psychology to see what these moral encounters actually mean to players and how data can be gathered that is reproducible to see whether these experiences have anything to say in the quant quantitative um, dimension. Uh, very difficult thing, by the way, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and uh, the most recent branch is something I'd like to call production ethics. So looking not at, uh, at, at just video games, but at how video games are produced. So regarding the uh, circumstances in which video games are produced as something of ethical concern, right? We don't want to be uh, taught morality by games that are produced under circumstances that um, that uh, have system uh, systemic uh, harassment or exploitation within these systems or just material exploitation and outsourcing of cheap labor forces, right? So this is these are the dimensions of video game ethics. So the core questions are, how is it implemented? So how is morality implemented? How does it feel? And how is it created on a macro level? Now, video game ethics is very is a very inspiring and interesting field, but comes with its own issues. Um, given that every writer or uh, author or researcher in, the, in this field has their own um, perspectives, their own approaches, it is a very ambiguous field where there is not a lot of agreement, more a lot of people on agreeing to disagree, which makes it also a very opinionated, which I think is a problem. I don't think that it's a problem that we have different perspectives, but I have. I think it's a problem that a lot of opinions are not based on um, solid research, nor on any kind of empirical data or, or um, regarding players uh, as entity in their research. But I see, I, I at least in my uh, overall research, saw a lot of imposing your own understanding of uh, ethics to evaluate a game experience, which I think is not the right way to handle it. This leads to having a lot of unreliable unre methodologies that cannot be produced. Uh, Pereira Santos, a scholar from the Netherlands, has uh, done a dissertation about that. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's very difficult to then produce methodologies that are reproducible for other scholars to use which leads a lot of people, especially in the industry, but also in, in research, to believe that there is little practical use for this. Why practical in italics? Because I think that there is a lot of practical use for regarding video game production as something that needs ethics in regards of research, but also uh, application. Right. So, um, so way I encountered these issues, and I I wasn't scared away. I thought that I might regard them as a challenge and see how I can go on with my mission, right, to make the world a less uh, exhausting place by doing research about video game ethics and finding ways to improve um, our situation in working and studying environments. So to do that, I had to connect the dots of these three fields, namely using morality as a game design element while considering players as autonomous moral agents to enable progressive social impact. So this is the mission I'm on. It sounds quite big, but it boils all down to three uh, solutions I had to find, namely um, in order to provide a framework in which players can learn something sustainable from a moral experience, obviously they would have to deal with a game that has inherently already a high moral complexity, something like Papers, Please, or Detroit Become Human, then deploy that game in a moderated framework to kind of streamline the learning outcomes, right? Not just let people play, but kind of take them and uh, at their hands and kind of guide them through a learning process and most importantly um, provide a metric provide evidence i'm not saying proof evidence that there has been some form of learn impact that can be reproduced to do that i started off with um, looking at 
possible metrics and it is a this is something that Pereira Santos already mentioned it's very problematic because in game we behave differently than in the real world because it's a simulation there are no real world consequences for us so we're more likely just to experiment right if we do something in a game it doesn't mean it has to be representative of our real life uh, and a lot of these kind of metrics try to create psychometric profiles which are unreliable and um yeah not not usable for this kind of research uh, so i reached out to psychologists and a colleague of mine who um, currently does his phd on vr uh, said that there is this empirical construct called moral competence it's developed by a german psychologist um, and it is the ability to translate moral intuition into action i'll repeat again moral competence is the ability to translate moral intuition into action now what makes this very special is that it doesn't ask how moral you are, what kinds of principles you have, nor what kinds of principles you think you have. So it's really not what, what, what your moral intuition about, but only about the fact of how effective are you in translating your intuitions into action. So there's this very strong performative emphasis that I'm, uh, you know, that is very important to me in my research. Uh, and the moral competence test, the MCT, allows to assess the score. And according to Lind and several studies that have been done throughout the last 20 years, this can be trained like a muscle. So you can strengthen your moral competence. And eventually, what has been indicated by different studies, having a high moral competence correlates with better mental health and pro-social behavior for the simple fact that if you have high moral competence, you're less conflicted with yourself. Your actions align more with what you think about them and you spend less time in regretting. It also allows you to apply more democratic behavior, be more patient with people with different backgrounds and different perspectives and be more collaborative with these. So especially if you're thinking about your own um, university learning environment or um, just your work environment, if you're if you're working in a tech company, another kind of cooperation, having this kind of skill definitely helps to make everyone's life a bit less exhaustive. So I have the metric. And um, luckily, Georg Lind, who has unfortunately deceased last year, however, left us uh, uh, his legacy in form of his um, dilemma discussion method, which is a patented workshop that can be used under the fair, under the fair use claim. I've been in touch before um, with him about that. And this workshop improves moral competence and has been deployed even in Germany at the German military. It was only cancelled once budgets were cuts, uh, cut in the early two, uh, 2010s and was also deployed effectively in corporate environments and uh, universities and schools. So what it basically does is that it uh, assesses your moral competence, it exposes participants, a group of participants to a written moral dilemma and lets them then form teams and discuss the issue. Um, then the discussion is closed. Again, later on, the moral competence test is done. This is being done a couple of times uh, during the year. And a lot of studies showed there would be a significant increase in moral competence, which, however, if not done regularly, can also decrease again. So obviously, my goal was not to just copy that, but gamify the whole thing. Uh, because I think that there are some aspects that are too loose in the design that could be done more engaging to get more people on board and provide a more entertaining and fun and obviously also a more effective experience for not users or participants, but players. So the mechanics and aesthetics that I am currently implementing into the workshop design are the following. So um, I'm using, a, instead of uh, using a written dilemma, I wanted to use a video game as dilemma exposition. I chose papers, please, to do that. Currently, that will be a different game. I will tell you uh, in a moment why uh, this game hasn't, uh, why Papers, Please remains not part of this workshop. Then we have the aspect of randomized teams to create a bit uh, of element of surprise and alertness and balance the thing also. So instead of just letting people form their own teams, they get into random teams. Then instead having, of having a lot of different perspectives, um, implementing something I like to call productive dualism, which is also backed by Celia Hodden's research that once you create, um, just uh, once you polarize uh, um, perspectives, you create like a kind of tension that let people in a more streamlined and effective way work towards solving um, 
uh, this tension. So instead of uh, allowing people to make up their own minds, there will be two main perspectives on a moral dilemma exposed by the game on which these teams have to argue for, of course, but freely with their arguments. Um, there will be cooperation in and between the uh, teams because at the end they have to form a consensus and there are clearly defined stages and objectives. We're currently also working on a balanced scoring mechanic uh, that allows uh, players to receive feedback on the quality of their arguments and there will be time limits for players. So not for eloquent people to dominate the discussion, every player gets the same time slot for presenting their arguments. So um, yeah, so I would basically doing uh, adaptation. I did that theoretically already in that paper, so you can check that out or ask me about it. I can forward it. And with that, I had my solution. So I had the video game uh, with moral complexity as an exposition. I have my moderated framework in which um, uh, the workshop takes place and I have my metric. So um, this is what I've been refining here throughout the last uh, months, but especially now here at Teachers College. And uh, last week I met before this conference um, when I was still wanting to present something slightly different to my supervisor, Dr. Joey Lee, an expert in VR and uh, social impact games. And he said that the idea isn't bad at this point, but there is a flaw in this, namely that the video game that I'm using for this workshop is somehow disconnected to the whole workshop design. And it is very true because in a way I have two layers of gamification, right? So I have people playing the video, playing a video game and people doing a workshop that is, however, not thematically integrated in the all over gameplay experience that create, creates quite a dissonance, which could be pretty much um, yeah, very disengaging. So I was so obsessed with making everything right, having the right mechanics, the right metric, the right game. And I totally forgot that at the end of the day, um, yeah, there was something missing to combine these things. And I was thinking, what is this? What is the element that really misses here in this design? And that is gameplay. Uh, Jorgensen calls gameplay or gameplay is how the game is played, delimited by the game rules and defined by the dynamic relationship that comes into being when the player interacts with these rules. This very unesthetic quote, but very functional, and this is something I like very much about Scandinavian game studies, so they're very always on point with their description, um, means a lot to me because it highlights the fact that gameplay is a set, is an architecture of various elements however, have to align together. They need to be combined in a unified gameplay experience to make sense to the players. Otherwise, people will disengage. And this is something that could be uh, have a tremendous and, uh, and a negative effect on the learning outcome of this whole exercise. So I thought for a moment, what would be the best way to attack that? And it would be making the whole workshop and game an RPG. Uh, luckily, we had today a talk on Twine, so I won't be going into the details. Into Twine is an interactive storytelling tool, very easy to use, and that allows me to create these moral dilemmas by myself, make them as an interactive fiction game, and make the whole experience of the workshop part of, an, uh, of a narrative superstructure that integrates the workshop design with the moral dilemmas that are um, yeah, done as a game replacing also manual instruction of how the workshop works with an onboarding experience, driving also accessibility, allows me to decrease difficulty and launch the thing on various platforms uh, or devices rather. To do that, uh, currently the um, the prototype of that is, or, or the prototyping phase goes into that direction that the role play will about um, envisioning a time where there were gods being uh, looking down on humans and basically making up their own mind about moral law would think about what is good and what is bad. And um, the idea would be obviously through a storytelling approach to uh, move players into the shoes of these gods. Why did I choose gods? Might be a bit controversial uh, uh, from a character perspective, but it is something that everyone can associate with. Uh, this. Uh, Thinking about a pantheon of gods is something everyone has already heard of and everyone can associate with, whether in a critical or not so critical uh, point. 
So the onboarding experience to the workshop would be a whole introduction to the whole game, uh, to the actual game, and then. I would have in these things um, dilemma expositions. There would be like four dilemmas that would be uh, presented as a visual novel, uh, more or less, or just interactive storytelling. On on basis of that, then the workshop would begin in role playing, being one of the uh, of these gods. Um, so that makes me uh, uh, having a method to integrate the aspect of having this the video game and the uh, and the workshop into one entity so I have a moderated framework as game itself using a game with moral complexity that is however thematically part of the whole workshop experience and in creating like this this unified um, integrated gameplay experience and in addition to that I have a metric to measure whether there is any impact. So what are my next steps? Uh, I'm currently here in New York for three months. Uh, I just finished my first month in which I was uh, uh, I, I, I was finalizing the theoretical design of the workshop. Um, the next steps, especially in June, will be to finalize the Twine game as fast as possible, start pre-pilot workshops uh, to see which kinds of mechanics work, fine-tune them and get already some feedback from people, and then uh, in July, launch the workshop. Uh, it would make sense to launch this on site, but when I sent, um, when I did the project proposal for this research, um, we were still in the pandemic, and it was like one year ago, so we didn't really know uh, whether things gonna work out that quickly as they did. So the pro project proposal is also kind of directed at e-learning exercise. So it's still most likely all gonna happen online. Um, just will has its own difficulties but we'll get around that so these workshops will be held online with one group in four consecutive meetings to see uh, also to give me a bit of a leeway to see throughout consecutive meetings with one control group whether what should be changed or does it make more sense if people already get to know each other and so on obviously record everything, um, take extens do extensive surveying, qualitative reports, measuring and iterating the thing along the way. Then obviously publishing the results, get some feedback. And I've been already in talks with a couple of people and got some feedback on the idea. And especially when thinking of making this workshop as something that could be practically deployed in a corporate environment, which I really would like to do because I think strengthening moral competence would be something that is dearly needed in corporate environments. But however, the best way would not to have uh, this more like complex uh, on-site workshop, but maybe eventually be able to scale and scope this down into a full mobile adaptation. Think about mindfulness apps with several workouts and these kind of things. This brings another set of problems with it, but from what I've heard already from people interested in that and doing that is that uh, having a mobile adaptation for employees, let's say, would be something very much favored. So I'm also currently looking into that. So let's conclude. So what I'm doing is not, not just video game ethics, but applied video game ethics. I personally believe that gamification has the potential to strengthen moral competence. And I personally, after dealing with education and video games after four years, well, it's quite a no brainer. It doesn't demand a lot of empirical research if you have seen by yourself learning effects with people and so on. However, what we want to do is that these kinds of methods convince people who are in the industry, convince people who are in academia and can make choices to integrate these systems. And these people need um, solid research that backs potential uh, impact, positive impacts of these methods. So this is what I'm doing here, trying to provide an empirical backing of my research. The approach must be also pragmatic. Uh, what I like to criticize is that in video game ethics, a lot of scholars tend to forget that we're all just human beings and we like to be entertained, we like to play, we like to have fun. We're not necessarily like some sublime moral entity that swirls around. No, we're very decent human beings and um, regarding us as such definitely helps better to create um, 
a proper uh, gameplay experience or uh, educational experience in that regards. The gamification of the workshop must be organic and scalable. It must be believable. And at the same time, it must allow for variation. This is what I'm trying to do with Twine. Workshop elements must be concentrated onto one platform to, to increase accessibility and decrease friction. And obviously, the effectiveness of the method awaits empirical results. Though there have been already, uh, already a couple of studies that tested the normal workshop. So I think that there are pretty high chances of this being in a gamified, being eventually even more successful. So if you're interested in my research, I'd be really uh, happy to connect. If you think, if, you, if, if you're yourself uh, in higher education or in university, if you are uh, in a corporate environment and you think this kind of workshop might be something uh, you'd like to have in your own place, let us please connect. Uh, there you get my contact data. However, this is also a perfect chance to um, uh, send us my, my my great thanks to people who stand also behind that project, which is the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation, who enabled me to come to Colombia and facilitate this research stay. My um, supervisor at my home university, René Schallega, and my supervisor at Columbia, uh, Dr. Joey Lee, and my colleagues from Control Z, who uh, are g giving me best guidance and consultation on setting up the Twine gameplay experience, which are Nick and Tom. So um, yeah, if you want to connect, uh, I'm here. I'll also stay around, and I'd be happy to chat. Obviously, also open for any questions. <laughs>